Hey everyone, Scott here. Before I get started with this episode, I want to talk to you about survival. In a few of the episodes on this show, we looked at incredible historical examples of people surviving through incredible situations, like Victorian explorer Richard Burton, who traveled through Somalia in the 19th century and managed to fight his way out of a tribal attack, even though he was hit in the face with a spear, and the spear tip went through both his cheeks. Well, I'm not here to talk about Richard Francis Burton, but a new podcast series from our friends at Parcast. And to ask the question, what would you do to stay alive? Would you wade through snake-infested water? Would you drink your own urine? Would you cut off your own arm? Normally, the answer is no, but when the stakes are life and death, you might be surprised at the lengths you'd go to save yourself. Every Monday, the Parcast Network's podcast, Survival, demonstrates the human spirit's ability to triumph over deadly adversity. Survival tells high-intensity stories of people in life-or-death situations and explores the strategies they use to survive. Some of the stories include a pilot and passenger crash landing in the Canadian Yukon in the dead of winter, a man escaping from a North Korean internment camp, and people trapped on sinking ships, and there's many more. You can search for and subscribe to Survival wherever you listen to podcast shows. Don't forget to rate and review the show and tell them that History Unplugged sent you. Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Did you hear about the kid who went swimming and almost drowned? He swore that he'd never get into water again until he really learned how to swim. Or did you hear about the cheapskate who made his will? He decided that he'd name himself as heir to get all the money. Or how about the guy with bad breath who decided to end his own life? All he had to do was wrap up his head and he asphyxiated himself that way. Now you might be thinking, okay, here we go. Is this going to be an entire episode of dad jokes? Maybe you've heard a few of those on this podcast, and if you have, I apologize. These are a kind of dad jokes that I just rattled off, but they're not exactly dad jokes. They're not even grandpa jokes. They're more like great, 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 great times 20 grandpa jokes. These jokes come from the philogeros, which is Greek for love of laughter. It's one of the oldest existing collection of jokes that we have. This document was written in Greek, and we think it was written in about the 4th century AD, but a lot of the jokes date back to centuries earlier. So it was written in Greek, but it was passed around among the Romans. The collection contains 265 jokes, and it's categorized into subjects such as teachers and scholars, and eggheads and fools. Some of the jokes work out pretty well, and some of them make almost no sense at all. One of the jokes in the Philogelos is described as an ancestor of Monty Python's dead parrot sketch. The joke goes that a man sells a slave to another man, and when the slave dies, the buyer goes back to complain. And the first man says, I don't know what you're complaining about. He wasn't dead when I sold him to you. So that's a forerunner of the dead parrot joke. Let me just rattle off a few more jokes from the Philogelos. A wife hater is attending the burial of his wife, who has just died. When someone asks... Who is it who rests in peace here? He answers, me, now that I'm rid of her. And one more. A glutton is marrying his daughter off to another glutton. Ask what he's giving her as a dowry. He responds, she's getting a house with windows that look out onto the bakery. Boom boom So in this episode, what I'm going to be doing is not just rattling off a bunch of Roman and ancient Greek and Sumerian and Egyptian jokes, although I will be doing some of that. I'm going to be looking into humor in the ancient world. What does humor mean across history? Sometimes we can recognize things as humor and as jokes, and I mentioned that forerunner to Monty Python's Dead Parrot sketch. But then there are other jokes that are completely baffling to us. But to the original audience, it would have been funny, or at least would have been recognized as humor, even if it was a bad joke or a dad joke, as we say today. So are there any universals in humor? What makes humor humor, and what can humor tell us about the past? So what I'm going to do in this episode is look at recent scholarship about humor in the Roman Empire, specifically work by the famous classicist Mary Beard. Then we're going to explore anthropology, where anthropologists try to look at the origin of humor, or at least speculate on where humor originates, since it seems to have existed since the earliest documents that we have, and we have to do some speculation. So where does humor come from, and What's its purpose in the human experience? Then we're going to look at how humor evolves and changes as we get up into the Middle Ages and Renaissance, 
and into the modern period. Now, some of the jokes here are PG-13, so just be warned. If you're volunteering driving a bunch of students to a youth group trip, or you're with somebody whose edgiest comedian they like is Jim Gaffigan, then parts of this episode might not be for you, so be forewarned. Some people in the past loved scatological or edgy humor, like people do today, and I'll give examples of that later on. One example comes from the Anglo-Saxon Codex Exoniensis, which is a poetry book, and it says, What hangs at a man's thigh and wants to poke the hole that it's often poked before? The answer, a key. There you go. Now, one other thing I want to mention before we really dive into this episode and what inspired it is this. I edit two websites in addition to producing the History Unplugged podcast. One site is called History on the Net, and the other one is called Authentic History, which is mostly a collection of old cartoons and audio recordings from the past. In Authentic History, there are a lot of cartoons from the late 19th and early 20th century, from the British humor magazine Punch or the American magazine Puck. And there's a lot of old cartoons you can find about the robber barons, about Andrew Carnegie, about Cornelius Vanderbilt. You can find cartoons about the early progressive era. And when I was reading some of the cartoons, I was a little bit baffled by some of them. Some of them, you can see the point that they're making, but they're not trying to be humorous at all. For example, there's one cartoon about Cornelius Vanderbilt, and it shows him standing like the gigantic colossus from the ancient world over rail lines, And the subtitle says, all freight seeking the seaboard must pass here and pay any tolls we demand. And so everything is labeled in the cartoon strip. It's not really humorous. Well, I guess it's humorous in a way, but it seems like it's hitting you over the head with a point that it's trying to make a propaganda track or propaganda from the Soviet era than anything humorous. And the question is, did people in the late 19th century in England find this humorous? Was humor so different then that it almost seems like there's an alien reaction to what is or isn't funny? And that's what's interesting. Stuff from Punch Magazine seemed more alien than jokes from the Greek or Roman era. So that's what inspired this question of what is humor? Why do people find things humorous? Are there any universals that we can track down where someone from an aboriginal tribe in New Guinea would find funny, as would a medieval monk, as would... A tenant in New York in the early 20th century who just arrived after passing through Ellis Island and somebody today. So those are some of the questions that we're going to get into. Now, classicist Mary Beard has looked closely at the Philo Gelos to try to understand what humor in the Roman era says about that period. And she notes that some of the jokes are pretty good. One of her favorite is a version of the Englishman and Irishman and a Scotsman walk into a bar type of joke or a pastor, a priest and a rabbi, depending on what variant you've heard. So the Roman joke goes like this. A barber, a bald man, and an absent-minded professor take a journey together. They have to camp overnight, so they decide to take turns watching the luggage. When it's the barber's turn, he gets bored, so he amuses himself by shaving the head of the professor. When the professor is woken up from a shift, he feels his head and says, How stupid is that barber? He's woken up the bald man instead of me. So that's a good one, because we get the humor, obviously, sort of has fun at the absent-minded professor's expense. And there might be elements where the working-class barber gets the better of the upper-class professor, and it tweaks the upper class. And that's humor that can sort of relate to the slobs versus snobs comedies, like Animal House in the 70s or 80s. Now, there's another joke that Beard mentions from the Philogelos that is funny, but it may not be funny quite in the way that Romans would have understood it. So there's another joke in which an absent-minded professor is asked by a friend, to bring back two 15-year-old slave boys from his trip abroad. And he replies, fine, and if I can't find two 15-year-olds, I'll bring you one 30-year-old. So we get why that's funny, because in his mind it's the same thing, but it's obviously not the same thing. But Romans could have understood it differently. For example, it could have been a joke about numbers. Questioning, are numbers real? If so, two 15-year-olds should be like one 30-year-old if they are. And it was showing the unnaturalness of the number system where Romans may not have been as convinced of actuarial tables like we are today. We take for granted in our data-driven society that numbers matter, but that might not have been the same case in the Roman Empire. We'll return to the Roman Empire, but first to illustrate how difficult it is to find a grand unified theory of humor is to describe the different ways that it's used in language and how words for funny or humorous or whatever have come into English from such different sources. In his 1922 book, The Sense of Humor, Max Eastman wrote, 
Eastman traced the word fun, from which funny is derived, to the Gaelic word fun. More recent references suggest a Middle European origin from fonen, which means to dupe or hoax or fool, which came into use in the early 1700s, so there could have been a different meaning back then anyway. Funnies, which was once used to describe Sunday comic strips, originated in the 1850s. Now, the word humor is of more ancient origin, which dates back to Latin and Greek, meaning a body fluid. So ancient physicians like Galen or Ibn Sina would have talked about the four humors, black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. And the humoral theory of Hippocrates goes to this. So the term humor crossed cultures from Greek to Latin with the spread of this belief system. In those ancient days, humor didn't mean being funny. We understood humor as lighthearted joviality after Shakespeare in the late 1600s. The Greeks and the Romans preferred the word comedy, Latin comedie, or Greek comedia, which was a combination of the root word komos, to revel, and aiden, to sing as in an ode. The word joke, which refers to something said or done to provoke laughter, especially with a climactic humorous twist, came into use about this time, despite its Latin origins, jocus, or jocularity, Kidding, to make fun of or deceive or taunt, came into use in the early 1800s from the Middle European kaidi, or the Old Norwegian kuth, for young goat, possibly because young goats are easily led. Wit is derived from witan, whose roots go back to the Sanskrit veda, which means knowledge, such as the Rig Veda, the ancient Hindu book of knowledge. Wit in German is witz and means both joke and acumen. Its root is Wiesen, to know. Wissenschaft, science, is a close kin to Furwitz and Aberwitz, which means presumption or cheek or jest. The term amuse derives from to muse, M-U-S-E. The word gesture has a very respectful ancestry. The chanson de geste played a prominent part in medieval literature from the 11th to 15th centuries. These were epics centered on heroic events. The name is derived from the Latin word gesta, deeds or exploits. During the Renaissance, satire tended to replace the epics of chivalry, and in the 16th century, the heroic jest turned into jest, J-E-S-T. So all of these different semantics of all these words that come from different languages, from Sanskrit, from Greek, from Latin, from Finnish, from Scandinavian languages, everything you can imagine— it shows the difficulty of trying to discover what's funny from a historical exploration of word usage. And there's so many words we have in English. To jest, to joke, to quip, to parody, to pun, to mock, to ridicule, to satire, wisecrack, witticism, fool around, tomfoolery, horseplay, skylarking, clown, clowning around, that you could just go on forever. So these words describe what's funny, but don't really define it. Well, let's return to the philagelos to see if we can crack this nut at all. Here's another joke from it. An Abderite, which is somebody hailing from a city in Thrace, saw a eunuch and asked him how many kids he had. When he said that he didn't have the balls, and this is a very colloquial translation, so as to be able to have children, the Abderite asked where he was going to get the balls. Well, that joke is number 114 in Philagelos. Now, we can definitely see the humor in that, and that joke is about as body as the Philagelos gets. Now, one challenge we have of getting these old jokes to come to us is transmission. The Philogelos, like many manuscripts from the ancient world, don't survive intact. It's not like we have a papyrus of the autographed manuscript from the 4th or 5th century lying around. Instead, typically copies from a medieval monk come down to us today. Maybe a medieval monk didn't understand the humor correctly because he didn't have the Greek understanding. Maybe he would omit some of the racier jokes because he didn't feel that it was fit to keep for posterity, and we don't exactly know. And beyond just jokes being body or not, there are some jokes where we have a cultural and temporal disconnect from. The 106th joke from the Philagelos goes, Professional beggar had been letting his girlfriend, or whatever equivalent term girlfriend would have meant at the time, lover, paramour, or whatnot, think that he was rich and of noble birth. Once, when he was getting a handout at a neighbor's house, he suddenly saw her. He turned around and said, have my dinner clothes sent here. So we can, again, understand the humor in that, but begging may have been recourse that was much more common back then for people to earn money 
Today, we only think of beggars as people who have hit the absolute lowest skids possible and are ejected from polite society. 